la fo hetra for nan hetra for nan for islam stand for peace la fo la fo hetra for nan hetra for nan all the time la fo hetra for nan hetra for nan for islam stand for peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another edition of Inspirational Africans where we bring to you Africans across the continent who are making great strides in their fields of endeavor. Today, we have yet another inspiring and of course exciting interview for you. Let us meet who our guest for today is. Featuring today on Inspirational Africans is one of Ghana's youngest academician, Dr. Sharif Khalid Mahmoud who is a lecturer in accounting at the Sheffield University of Management School in the UK with special interest in corporate governance, ethics, corporate social responsibility, transparency, and accountability. In 2016, he became one of Ghana's youngest PhD holder in corporate governance and corporate social responsibility from Henley Business School, University of Reading, at the age of 29. Dr. Sharif also holds an MSc in Energy Management from the Robert Gordon University, UK, and a BA from University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Dr. Sharif currently sits on the Executive Steering Committee of the British Accounting and Finance Association, Special Interest Group on Corporate Governance. His presence on the board confirms Greenwell's commitment to transparency and accountability, and especially at a time that good corporate governance has become a major issue for the corporate world following recent high-profile corporate scandals, most of which have been attributed to poor or bad corporate governance practices. As a population and environmental scientist, he is also honored for his research discovery at the University of Cape Coast, which gave an insight on the average Ghanaian household economic struggle for living. As a delegate on the Young Commonwealth Climate Change Summit and a one-time chairman of a panel with decisive resolutions and ideas as part of the precursor activities to the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit, which was in London and which made him an outstanding delegate to this summit. Dr. Sharif Mahmoud Khalid, welcome to Inspirational Africans. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, you have quite a very inspiring story, being a very young man who got your PhD at the age of 28 and got a full lectureship at the University of Sheffield at the age of 27. Are you among the youngest lecturers? I should think so. Yes. And uh, how, how does that feel? I mean, being a young man in academia where usually professors and doctors are of a very mature age, how are you fitting in in that environment? Well, I think uh, when you are blessed, you forget yourself. So I really don't, I'm not much cognizant of age and I'm not much cognizant of the fact that I've got a PhD at a very early stage. I just see myself as uh, one of those contributing societal development and progress. Okay. But how, how does your, your, your fellow lecturers and staff of the university relate to you? Very receptive to me. Okay. Plus, it's a very collegial environment at the Sheffield University and the management school specifically where I work for. So age is not a bracket, race is not a bracket. So it's one of the most collegial environments I've ever found myself in. I've just been welcome. I, I quite remember when I was given the job, I was flown from Ghana for the interview by the university. Okay. And well, I'll just tell you something interesting or an interesting background that led to that. I'd, I was at the twilight of my PhD okay. and taught to return home immediately after the PhD. Okay. So I thought, okay, well, let me test the waters back home. And I had a national obligation to meet. So I did come to the University of Cape Coast where I was received nicely to undergo that national obligation. So whilst I was there, I thought that, okay, well, I'm at the twilight of my PhD, sort of like a crossroad, what do I do? So I said, okay, well, as the month of Ramadan was approaching, I was like, okay, well, let me have an itikaf. Let me engage with Allah the Almighty and be guided as to what to do next in life. So I did uh, phone up the principal of the of Jamia International at Mankesim, and uh, he was very receptive to me. He did allow me to come and join his some of his students who were quite international as well, a broad stream of uh, international students from Kazakhstan and uh, other countries to join them in the Itikaf. Yes, so this, so, so this is a religious school. I yeah, think yeah, that's Jamia International. Yeah. So I did join them for the Itikaf, and you know, 
observe the rules of itikaf, prayer, engage, and said, well, Allah the Almighty guide me through it. But I mean, that's the thing about spirituality. Sometimes we, we have a feel of it without knowing. But when I was going into itikaf, I had applied for this job during that month. So I said to myself, okay, well, so I'm, itikaf is a special prayer, prayer like within yeah, a period of time. Of time where yes. you disengage yourself from what the world okay. and you engage within the spiritual. So we're you know, accommodated at the mosque. Okay. You say your prayers, you read the Holy Quran, and then okay. that's, so it's like a full engagement. With For that. how long? For like, that's the last 10 days of Ramadan. Okay, the last 10 days of Ramadan. Yeah, okay. so when I was stepping into itikaf, I said to myself, uh, I'm pretty sure when I step out of itikaf, I'd, I'd have an email shortlisting me for an interview. Okay. So I did step out of itikaf, turn on my phone, and I did receive an email from the University of Sheffield. Okay. And uh, it, it was quite intriguing and very interesting because that's like um, a leading global university. The management school is triple crown among the top 1% leading management schools. So you would think that uh, I might not have a place. I mean, that was like, well, that was something I was giving a go. But once you have the spiritual guidance and backing, I think it, it did come. So, well, when it came up, I was like, okay. I phoned them and I said, look, I'm in Ghana. And they're calling me for an interview in two days. Uh, can we do a Skype interview? And they're like, no, we want to see the people when we employ. We, we need to engage them on a one-to-one -one basis. So I had to get a ticket the following day. I think that was immediately after Eid. And then uh, I flew into Sheffield for the presentation. So this is how it's normally done. You, you'd have an, in, at, uh, they'll give you a topic to give a presentation to the staff of the university, after which then you crack down into an interview session. Okay. So when I went into, I did the presentation and you, know, you started to get the signs that you were really gonna get this job. So, but when I went in, everyone on the, we were shortlisted. I think about four to five of us, I was the only one at the twilight of my PhD, all of them were post -logs. What is at the twilight of your PhD? Like, I think I was writing up what okay. it means at the tail end of at my PhD. PhD. Yes, I had PhD. had an examiner okay. appointed, but I hadn't submitted so hadn't the full confirmed, confirmed the, yeah, the, the, the PhD. PhD. So okay. I was like about submitting it to okay. be examined. Okay. So I I said to myself, so, okay. So strictly, you are not even qualified then because the job was for PhD candidates. Right? Well, they would say PhD candidate, but normally what happens in academia, PhD, uh, yeah, no, know. what happened in academia is that they would say a PhD holder. Okay. But once there is strong evidence that you of say. your completion okay. and uh, what they call a track record that you could make it happen in academia, they would consider so let's, you. So let's go back to the, to the story. Yeah, so, so within the story, when I showed up for the interview, uh, so I was put in a hotel. I mean, these were all expenses paid by the university. So I was put in a hotel. I left my hotel room. I was slated for nine for the presentation. So I showed up and realized that everyone had a PhD except me okay. because I was still in the process of submitting my PhD and somewhere into post-doc uh, for three years. So somewhere you already, a number of candidates a number for, that of candidate for that particular role. post. Okay. I think it was for two. Okay. Yeah, it was for two. So I said to myself, well, do I really fit into this? But well, I said it. Usually I said it, as usual, I said a silent prayer and said, well, Allah the Almighty knows best. So I committed myself to him and then put up my best. So I went in for the presentation. Uh, after it, then a professor who walked up to me whilst I was having lunch went like, that was a fabulous presentation. Then I started to get signs and confidence that things would go well. Then post that, I went into the interview session, which went pretty well. Um, I left there. While on the train, back to, because uh, while, uh, while I was engaged with the University of Cape Coast, my student had exam that same week of the interview. So I had to return to Ghana quickly to sort out the examination stuff. So while I was abroad, I was arranging all of that. So I did, while on the train, back to my base, which was Reading, where I earned my PhD, so I could, which is not far off from the airport, Heathrow, to fly off to Ghana the following day, I had a call from uh, the dean of the business school, or the management school. Then, but the train lines were very bad, so I couldn't get him. But from the way he sounded, I knew he was gonna give me an offer. So I was like, okay, Sharif, when you get home and you can talk, text me on this line and we'll have a conversation. So I got home and uh, walked. I got into Reading and said, no, I can't wait to get home. So I walked into my favorite coffee shop. I would send a photo of that to your team. But I walked into my favorite coffee shop and uh, I was like, okay, I'm home. I texted him and he called me and said, well, he said one of the most beautiful words to me. He was like, uh, Sharif, I have a job for you. Uh, we've seen great talent in you and we want to develop you. Welcome to the Sheffield family. And this was very inspiring and uh, just very motivating and you know, invigorating. And I said to him, okay. Then he said, well, this is the offer. That's how much of salary do you want? So have you got a wife? 
<laughs> and they were like, no, well, but I'm planning to get married soon. They were like, okay, confer with your partner and see if she wants to live in Sheffield. So that's how the entire process started. And uh, I'm, two, I'm in my third year in, uh, in Sheffield. So there's an opportunity, a perfect opportunity to actually jump into your childhood and see how growing up your experiences, your education, how it has influenced you, you know, who you are as a person today. If you can tell us a bit about your upbringing. Well, it's, it's, I've had a very interesting upbringing. I mean, uh, in the latter days of my life, being identified as the son of a politician makes many people think, or make many people think that you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, but that's not really it. I've, I've gone through different stages of life and I've really seen the different shades of, to life. I mean, I, I grew up from a suburb in, in, in Wa, uh, known as Jejeriri. I mean, if, if those who know Jejeriri, it's not really a gated community, as many will think. It's, it's a very communal community. And I grew up in my grandfather's compound, where my dad... That's in the Upper West, in the upper West region, where my dad had an apartment okay. within and with, with, with his brothers and uh, sisters and what of you all living. So we, we all had, they all had their homes within it. So I started growing up from there. But my mom and dad started life off as teachers, uh, both, so I'm a progeny of uh, two teachers, probably hence me being in academia. <laughs> I don't know if that's got any connection with that. But still, this, what was, uh, this was what happened. And um, fast forward to life. Uh, so I've seen it all. I worked dead for dead before, but not really as a, a sign of poverty, but probably it's just like uh, not being very disciplined as so a young boy. So what about your education? Yeah, so education has really been um, very nice. And uh, I would say, much as my parents were not that fabulously rich, I would say, but I went to the best of schools. Mm -hmm. So I, I probably about the only international school in Wa then, which was Danibu International, that's where I had my basic education and uh, went off to Tia Ahmadiyya Secondary School. And I'll tell you an interesting story about how I got to Tia Ahmadiyya Secondary School. I think, uh, you know, that stage of life when you're filling out forms to go into secondary schools, you want to be with friends and all of that. So I'd chosen to be in Prempe College at the time. Oh, and the leading secondary, yeah, the leading secondary schools. schools. And, you know, there was friends who were quite competitive about where to be for secondary education. So Tia Ahmadiyya Secondary School was actually not on my radar. But uh, I had actually secured an admission to go into Prempe College. So whilst preparing, getting my stuff to go to school, uh, the current Amir, who is family, my uncle and my dad invited me to a family meeting. The Amir of Ghana. Yes, yes, invited me to a family meeting and they went like, uh, Sharif, you can't go to Prempe College. You've got to go to Tia Ahmadiyya Secondary School, which is our school. I rebelled and well, they made, they, they expanded very cogent points. They were like, okay, well, this is our school, we're promoting it. If we don't let our wards stay in it, who would we encourage to be there? I was probably very young to understand where they were coming from. As of now, I really understand perfectly where they're coming from. But well, it was sort of like um, I was being forced to go to Ahmadiyya Secondary School or to Ahmadiyya Secondary School. Uh, I had to succumb at some point to their pressure. But I think it was a blessing in disguise because I really defined myself, okay. my leadership potential, my leadership skills, my reading culture, mm -hmm. and all of that. And uh, above all, my commitment to prayers and uh, Islam Ahmadiyya and everything in Ahmadiyya Secondary School. Mm -hmm. So when I was sent to school, uh, upon arrival, I said to myself, I mean, back in the day when you failed uh, in some couple of subjects or you, f not, you didn't perform well in your first year, you were withdrawn. So I was like, okay, well, I would prefer to go and not perform very well in Tiamadiya Secondary School, be, be withdrawn, and I would go to uh, Prempe College and even repeat. But when I got into Tiamadiya Secondary School, I, I don't know what happened. The whole idea I had vanished. The school embraced me, and uh, I just said to myself, look, I've got to prove myself that I can make it into Yamandia Secondary School. So to parents that have been in, have, that have been to Infancepe, Madisadol, and uh, uh, Prempe College, I've got to prove to them that we can make it here. So that was a starting point of it. And uh, I became senior prefect at some point. I guess you handed over to me as senior prefect. So I became senior prefect uh, in Tiamadia Secondary School. I got exposed to a lot of leadership engagement in Model UN and the likes of it. So beyond so, your academia, you engage in other extra, other extra activities. Yes, so yes, 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 I was. But there's an interesting thing about it. The extracurricular activities are very important and vital to an individual life's uh, development or school. I'll say that has really been one of the, the triggers to where I am today, because you'd realize that um, I remember that I was so engaged in these activities to the extent that one teacher of mine got really scared and went like, 
Sharif, if you don't take time, you're going to fail your ex final exam. Well, I didn't, but I did really learn, alhamdulillah. I did learn quite a lot from that. And because these are tested skills you can buy off any shelf or probably go like this, the tangible to it. it. It builds up over time. And that was what happened uh, leading off to secondary school. So I developed like strong leadership skills from Tia Ahmadiyya Secondary School where I went off again. So that tells you how integral it is in life to listen to our parents and to really seek their advice and consent when it comes to key major decisions in life. So when I was moving to university, then there was another point or another episode of my life. Uh, my dad had been to the University of Cape Coast for all his degrees, from diploma to degree and to his master's and everything. He did it there and to his specialist program. So he's so much in love with the University of Cape Coast. He thought they had rigor. He thought they have discipline and all of that. So he'd always earmarked me to be in the University of Cape Coast, which I did not like. So I was like, okay, well, uh, through my leadership experience, I'd develop a passion for politics. So I said, well, I was going to do politics. And again, naively, I thought, said to myself, then I'm going to university to read political science. So I'd applied into Legon. And uh, I mean, all the universities in Ghana then for um, my first degree. And I did get admissions for all of the universities I applied into. I'm not too sure of our KNUST, yeah, but I did get admissions for. So Legon actually gave me political science, economics. That's the University of Ghana. Yeah, University of Ghana for mm -hmm. political science, I think, uh, economics and uh, geography and resource management. So I was so excited about it, wanting to be there. Then my dad called me up and went like, no, you're not going to Legon, you're going to Cape Coast. I'd applied into Cape Coast to read population studies as well. So yeah, go to Cape Coast because that's where the rigor is. That's where I want you to be. I rebelled again, but well, I had to succumb to it because he's got to pay the fees. Even at that, my Legon forms were bought for me by one of my aunties because I'd called her and went like, you know, auntie, you've got to convince dad to get me forms for Legon because he's not trying to do it. And I said, okay, she, she told me I'd get them for you. So she got me in the forms. So I, I did go to Cape Coast. And again, the first, my first two weeks in Cape Coast wasn't fun. So I said, well, I was getting back to Legon. <laughs> My dad said, no way, you've got to be in Cape Coast. I stayed in Cape Coast and again, I learned so much from, I have not regretted one bit uh, attending the University of Cape Coast, where I again became student leader. I became SRC president and sat on the university council for a year, you know, deliberating over university's day-to-day -day activities and uh, taking key strategic decisions. I was part of the team that uh, hitherto used to, a role that used to be, uh, you know, sourced out to consultants, where like the, I, was, I was probably about the only student in that committee called the Strategic Review Committee, where we, we put up a strategic document and plan policy for the university for a five year span, which was, again, another very interesting thing to do. You know, I sat on the entity tender board. So these were like, there were a broad spectrum of boards and, you know, committees I served on, which built my leadership. Uh, credentials. So you, from secondary school to university, all of these were like important, you know, milestones in your life yeah. in terms of developing your organizational yeah. leadership skills, of course, as well as your academic, academic you know, yeah. ability. So you finish UCC and you apply to go to school abroad? Yeah, well, uh, uh, after University of Cape Coast, uh, I was trying to do a bit of politics because, I mean, it's always known that um, when you are out of uni as a student leader, the, the, the surest path is to, to jump onto the national stage or jump, jump on the bandwagon of politics. So I was, I then joined one of the, uh, I, I became a, one of the pioneering members of the com communication strategic team of the government back then, and where we're doing a lot of stuff around till I, my dad told me, look, man, young man, you've got to build a profession for yourself before politics. And again, that sinks onto the Legon aspect. When I, was so, when I was trying to convince him to read uh, political science, he told me, look, young man, it doesn't take a, a, a political scientist to be a politician. So, and I think that was a very strong pitch he gave. And uh, well, he, he's got this, um, what, do you call, what do we call it? He's got this uh, saying at home. Each time he says it, we know we can't go further. He'll just go like, this is non-negotiable. So when he goes, this is non-negotiable, we know it's a final deal. So when he told me that, I knew, well, I didn't have any option to go for that. So I did um, go into uh, what he called, I, he told me, look, leave politics and build a profession first. So, well, I did oblige. And uh, at the time, I applied into a couple of universities to go read. Uh, a master's degree. That then, around that time, that was about 
the time Ghana had discovered oil. So we, well, strategically, I thought that, okay, well, why don't I go do something relative or related to the oil and gas industry and become a pioneer in whatever area I want to go into. So I went in to read energy management with specialization oil and gas and renewables in Scotland, Aberdeen. Then uh, whilst reading it, I, I just felt that I wasn't cut out for industry. Then I said to myself, what can I do? I said, okay, well, maybe I should consult for industry or probably research and tell industry what to do and it's up for them to do it because I, I particularly was not really a fan of what was happening within industry because back then we had a BP Macondo incident and all of that. So I felt like uh, I had a very strong ethical or business ethic uh, instincts uh, against multinationals and right or wrong, but that was the feeling at the time. So I, I did say to myself, okay, well, I should read a PhD and become an academic where I can consult as well. So. I put in a lot of work into that, and uh, sometimes people see it and they think that, well, you, it just happened overnight. So I started to apply for a PhD with my first semester results from my MSc. Okay. And I would say I'd probably send a proposal to over 100 professors around the world wow. seeking supervision. And you could get sometimes some of them get back to you, can you tweak it this way to see what I've got a funding for this, and I really wanted to do it a certain way. So I stood my ground and went like, no, this is what I want to do. So I was being turned down in some universities. Some professors turned me down, and, but I, I kept on persevering until I got to one of the leading authorities in corporate governance in the UK, Professor, then known as Professor Jill Solomon, who is now Jill Atkins. So Jill Solomon sent me a very beautiful email. Well, I think back then I'd, gone to, I'd applied to St Andrews, a very leading university in Scotland to one professor in the area I wanted to study, who is Rob Gray. And Rob wrote to me and went like, Sharif, even though you, you've got a very nice proposal, and that proposal has got a lot of promise, but I'm sorry I'm retiring and will not be in a position to supervise you, but I recommend Jill Solomon for you. So I didn't know he had sent an email ahead of my email to Jill Solomon and said, look, I've got this pretty young man who is very good. His proposal is good. Could you do it for him? So I sent an email to Jill Solomon and she replied me and I went like, Sharif, I'm extremely interested in your proposal. However, at the time I was applying, she was in King's College London, okay. where I was to be with her. But then, she, you know, academics do move around. So okay. she had gotten a professorship or a chair, in prof a chair, a professorial chair at the Henley Business School. So she went like, okay, but this is the problem. I'm moving to Henley. Is it King's you want to be in or you want to be with me? Then I told her, well, it's your supervision I want. So wherever you go, and regardless of the university, I'm going to go with you. So I rechanneled my application into the, uh, what do you call it, Henley Business School. Interestingly, I had not completed my dissertation when I had an offer to read a PhD. So you, you do have a history of not completing <laughs> yeah. before getting offers. Offers, you know? yeah. So I had the offer to read um, uh, for the PhD in, in financial and accounting management uh, with specialization in corporate governance and social responsibility. So, but then they put me in a fix. They made it a conditional offer and said that I must have a distinction or minimum a merit. If I didn't get any of this, my admission, or my, yeah, my admission will be revoked. revoked. Okay. So I went on for that. And I needed to really work hard. My dissertation needed to come out really very great to really meet the requirement. And alhamdulillah, I did meet the requirement. And that was life at Henley Business School for me. So, yeah, you moved from Aberdeen to Henley Business School, yeah. from Henley Business School to Sheffield. You got your PhD, you're yeah. now teaching. I want us to focus on how the knowledge that you have acquired is relevant to our African situation. Well, it is quite because uh, the interesting thing about it is that I love Africa to bits. Why? I've never loved Africa as much as I do now. Living in Africa or in Ghana or any continent makes you, I think, we get very complacent and comfortable. But living out of Africa in the last like, more than half a decade had actually made me appreciate Africa. It's made me love Africa and uh, makes me want to return to Africa any day. I feel sad each time I come into town and I have to leave. It's, it saddens me so much. And each time, uh, contrary to the, you know, the pessimistic cry of uh, what Africa is like or the outlook of Africa. Each time I step down the plane on an airport in any African country, I see nothing but opportunity. 
I mean, Nigeria is one of the countries I love to bits. When I go in there to work, I see nothing but opportunity. Why do you think that those of us in Africa do not recognize these opportunities and we are all well, interested in seeking greener pastures? pastures. Everywhere? I think uh, we're so fixated to the negativity of Africa, which we've been fed with by Western media. I mean, uh, I, I've always had the cause to complain sometimes when they're flying some people out who have no knowledge about Africa to come to Africa and talk about Africa. When we have leading people who have understand Africa, who understand Africa from what they do to rather be. But we, we sort of like tend to have uh, a cliche of um, big names and uh, what have you. And we don't attach a lot of relevance to competences in the area. But I mean, it, it, so that makes me uh, channel my research to Africa. If, much as I'm working out of Africa, my research is solely on African development. So I look at African economies, I look at African businesses, I look at you know, accountability and transparency, I look at resource cares in Africa and all of this. So my research teams have always been on Africa, which I've always sought funding for that gets me around the world in, in most African countries to, okay. to do what I have to do and impact the continent from wherever so I am. So the question that I asked, well, mm -hmm. how, how do you think that knowledge is relevant? Or what are the areas that you feel that through your experience and yeah. your research, yeah. what can we do in, in terms of the development for our continent? From, I mean, yeah, from yeah, one of, the, one of my, uh, the, the very recent research I've been engaged with that has brought me to Ghana probably about on five trips for last year and again this year has been the resource case. I mean, we, we, we're running into the, the first decade of the discovery and production of oil in Ghana. So I've always sought, or I've been out there asking the question, what has been the relevance or the importance or the impact of oil discovery in Ghana? What's the future? Is there any case study around Africa? We've got a, a cousin nation, which is Nigeria. Are we learning from the past of Nigeria? What are the propositions we have? So I've always maintained and uh, recommended. This has made me, you know, be in a position to engage governments, the executive, ministers, um, that's executive I mean, uh, what it, civil society, academics, mm -hmm. you know, and the media on all of these issues. Uh, we talk about the Petroleum Revenue Management Act or Bill, yeah, Act now, and I go like, yeah, I'm an ardent critic of it. I go like, you know, why would you go and have a cut and paste from Norway to come and uh, you know, have that same replicated in Ghana when we have a different economic setting, we have a different social setting. I have always, like my research have always informed me to advise against some of these things, which is I, like uh, IE, we talk about um, at the time of oil discovery in Norway, Norway had rich an economic situation and they could afford to touch trove of, uh, you know, cash into troves for future use. We're not, we don't have that luxury. So I've always advised, why don't we, rather than, you know, putting the money into, uh, troves of future use, which could be squandered by any government yeah, of the day. You're referring to heritage, heritage funds, funds you know, yeah. You invest your invest, oil revenue, yeah, revenue against what? So why don't that we, we should invest it today. now? Build petrochemical industries, yeah. build allied industry, yeah. build you know a core, you know a competent core of technical um, knowledge and yeah. skill and development that will really put us within that economic uh, equilibrium yeah. or there's you know, a, there's saturation there's that there's would now allow. Thought. Yeah. There's a school of thought that uh, a lot of our resources haven't been to our benefit because they are extracted by huge multinationals, so our gold and our yeah. oil. A lot of the profits are short out of the country. You know what? What is? And some people think probably we're even better off not exploring our natural resources. No, well, I, I, I don't think uh, I'm averse to to that uh, kind of argument. When you look at it, uh, natural resources. Um, in terms of oil and what have you, these days there's, there's even going to be synthetic gold soon. Mm -hmm. There's been an alternative to all these natural resources. So if you leave it down there, it's going to lose value okay. in some years to come because technology is far advanced. Okay. I used to you know, engage in this kind of engagement and thoughts as well until I had empirics that points to other side of it. So but I really think... Not to cut it, but with your study of all of these agreements, do you feel that these agreements are always skewed to the disadvantage of Africa? Yes, they are. They are because uh, I, I, I actually research multinational, um, uh, what do you call it, and transnationals, looking at the accountability, transparency, and impacts in the African economy. And what you realize is that we've got very weak legislations. Okay. We've, we've got uh, a weak parliament that really does not scrutinize some of these things to really get them to like in your to the benefits. You look at the agreements of mining concessions and what have you, and you're going to weep at to some of the clauses that we have there that are not for the sustainable development of our people as or the African people. So that really makes it. But then again, do you blame the multinationals because they are in to make profits and maximize profit? So we have to be engaging enough and develop strong negotiation skills 
to be in a position to engage these multinationals to have a win-win situation because they're also coming with a key competence scale that we don't have. Then again, what sort of joint ventures are we creating to have skill transfer from these multinationals to our local folks? Uh, the other day I was on a, on, on a flight to Ghana and had this ponytailed tattoo chap by me who couldn't express himself in the English language properly. I think he spoke Portuguese or something. And uh, he was being brought in by a multinational oil company you know, to, 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 to operate a crane and a forklift. So something that you know, local uh, scale so could, could have acquired. Mm -hmm. And this, we're talking about, we're moving into a first decade of oil production. And we've been in mining for years and years. Since the days of Don Diego de Azambuja. Yeah. And so, yet we don't have, yet we don't have skills. And so we, we're not, so, we're not so concentrating. Feel, right? like, just so you feel that we should invest our revenues from our extractive industries in developing you know, other industries around yes. those. So yes, like agriculture, agriculture uh, what do you call petrochemical industry. Industry, industry, and what like you, but what, industry jewelry industries, mining. but what I mean, we, we, if you produce diamonds in Africa, you know how many African countries promote or are a center for diamond trading? Yeah. None. None. You have to go to Antwerp okay. in the, what do you call in in, in, in Belgium, yeah, to okay. trans, uh, because Antwerp is a market for diamonds, but where they're not producing diamonds, gold, where is it traded? We don't have gold refineries. Just a few are coming up now, I think, in South Africa and other places. Yeah, so let's... Uh, and if okay. you look at also the base of our education, I think uh, we're behind global education probably over 100 years. Okay. But no one is actually concentrating on technical education. Technical we're education. all thinking about tertiary university degrees that really have no skills. So it's important that we also, you know, Put develop premium or place premium on technical uh, education. Before I, I mean, of course, if you're still young, but we'll, start, we'll talk about your prospective family life. But let me just say, I mean, yeah. my penultimate question about politics. You've yep. expressed a strong interest in politics. Yep. A lot of people see uh, politics as a very dirty game, especially in yep. Africa. Yep. I mean, as you engage in it, is it do, do you get scared? Is it, are you still, do you still think well, that you might engage well, in politics? Well, I used to have a lot of passion and uh, st strong uh, red blood running in me when it comes to politics. But these days I'm a little laid back and uh, you know, receive it with a, bit of, with a bit of skepticism as to whether I want, really want to do it or not. So I'm putting it to prayer. And you know, one of the, the things that really scares me to, to death is that I keep asking myself this fundamental question, can I make the change I wish for? And it's been a constant no in the last couple of years, which has made me hold back. I've always said, if I don't have a yes for an answer, there's no need getting into it. Why do we have to go in and not have an impact? But then there's always a scary bit of it of friends and family or probably well wishes, you know, telling you, look, if you don't go into it, you have the other guys getting it and destroying it. Just get in and do, and do what you can do. But I don't really, lately, I'm not of the philosophical view that politic, politics is like, you know, the sort of, uh, is a panacea to our solutions. I think that if we sh brighten our corners, where we are, the entire country will be well lit. Tell us a bit about your married life, I mean, your personal life. Are you married? Are you, do you yeah. have kids? Well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I, 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 I think I'm like, uh, I'm less than a month old into marriage. Okay. So I recently got married. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, so, yeah, um, still, and, um, I mean, you're still very young. Yeah, and looking forward to producing blissful children and blissful a blissful children. home. So, and um, uh, what, what, what does the future right hold for you the next coming decades? I mean, you've already achieved so much so young, but what do you look forward to in the future? Well, I mean, this academia and, uh, the ultimate of every academic is to be a professor. So I'm working hard towards that, publishing my papers, trying to get them out into leading journals, you know, seeking grants, engaging governments, you know, engaging civil society, impacting society, and all of that. I Do mean, you intend coming back home at some point? Yeah, or? definitely. Why not? Home is home. You've okay. got to come home. Well, viewers, I hope you have learned that you don't have to be old and grain before you can make some great achievements in your life. And I hope that you have really enjoyed and learned something from today's episode of Inspirational Africans. Join us again for our subsequent editions. Thank you very much for watching. Asalaamu Alaikum.